Boreda, and welcome to the Welsh History Podcast. My name is Jonathan, and I will be your host for this podcast, and I hope you enjoy as we talk about Welsh history across the ages from the Stone Age to the Modern Age. I guess the first question is, who am I? My name is Jonathan Williams. I am a Canadian, thus my accent does not sound like a Welsh, or for that matter, English accent. I will not try to sound like a Welsh or English accent, as my copying of that is not necessarily the greatest thing in the wide world for you to listen to. However, uh, I am, I would say, a trained historian. I did my bachelor's degree in history. I've done part of a, a master's degree in history. I do understand how to research and look up sources, primary sources, secondary sources, how to differentiate what's actually legitimate sourcing and what isn't. And uh, I have a passion for Welsh history uh, that comes from the fact that my ancestors on my father's side were all Welsh. And my desire to understand and, and know more about them led me to live there for four years. And I feel like it uh, made it even more real for me as I wandered around the historical sites of Wales, as well as, you know, being among the people of Wales. And ever since then, I've wanted to do something to sort of mark that and share that with people outside of my immediate family, who I will talk history with at any drop of the hat. Just ask them, they'll complain. <laughs> when did I first get interested in Welsh history? Well, that came about because of a small book called When Was Wales, which was written by Gwyn A. Williams, uh, written in 1985. That just happened to be when I turned 16, and I was very excited about history at that point in time. That's actually where I caught the academic bug, as it were. But, as well, I think going beyond that, I sort of became interested in trying to understand Welsh culture, Welsh language. I had always had an interest in that, even as a young man, uh, as a young boy. My grandfather, I would always sort of bug about Welsh uh, things, including how to say my name in Wales, which he teased me by saying it's Jonathan. And I went, wow, that's exciting. <laughs> um, and that book was really fascinating for me. It helped me sort of grasp onto some of the culture, some of the history, some of the lifestyle that goes on in Wales at the time. I ended up reading a number of other uh, Welsh history and cultural books, uh, started to get to know some of the political lay of the land, as well as some of the background of why Welsh and Wales survives to this day when in other cases and other situations they could have easily have been assimilated and i think that interest grew on me as time has gone on rather than lessening i think for me it's always been something that's kind of been in the back of my mind is how can i honor that and one of the things that drove me to actually move to wales in the beginning of well in mid-1999 and to live there for a number of years as a uh, Welsh resident, I loved living over there. I loved the people. I loved the area. I loved everything about it. It was so wonderful in so many respects. And always say I would willingly go back if there was the right circumstance and situation. And have tried on one other occasion to do just that. Uh, as it turned out, it just happened to be that we moved back for uh, various family reasons. Um, family got a little big, so it was time to kind of make some decisions about the time my original ancestry visa expired and we decided to come back to Canada. Long story short, that's how I became interested in Welsh history. I have tried hard to learn the language uh, at times more than others. I can pronounce some of the words okay. Some of them will always be difficult. Uh, Welsh is a very difficult language to just speak, especially for an English speaker, uh, because there's letters in it that just don't exist in English and in some cases the pronunciation of such are not normal for our mouths so it takes some work and I've just never been in a position where I've had enough time to to do it properly and living in South Wales uh, predominantly didn't 
talk to a lot of people who spoke Welsh. So it became difficult to sort of spread that idea around. So what is Wales? Wales is a small region in Britain. Uh, it small by comparison to say a state or a province in Canada, for example. Uh, it has 3 million people, so from a population size, especially if you're looking at it from a Canadian perspective, it's not that small. And predominantly, the people live in the southern part of the Wales, and predominantly people live in the less mountain mountainous regions on the coast, both in the south, west, and north. And that will remain the case uh, pretty much throughout its history. Wales has had a very interesting history over the thousands of years of its existence either as a country uh, as a principality or as you know any number of divisions and regions over its lifetime and i think that's one of the reasons why i'm really excited to talk about this with you because to me that's one of the great things about wales wales is such a historically diverse place that's had things influenced on it by being close to this neighbor called England, uh, having actually influenced that same country with invasions and making alliances with neighbors to fight against them, uh, in the end becoming sort of a thorn in the side of both the English and the Romans, enough to be invaded quite heavily on both occasions, and with military garrisons based quite heavily on both occasions. And in the end... Uh, Wales remains unique in that respect, even as it, you know, became assimilated, even as Henry VIII tried to unite England and Wales uh, in the 1500s, there was still this sense of Welsh culture and Welsh history and Welsh language, more importantly, and even as attempts were made to anglicize more and more of Wales, and we all know some of this is true fact, some of this is legendary, I would say. Uh, there still is a sense of what is Wales and what is Welsh. And even today in the culture, there's a lot of people who would argue about what is and isn't Wales. And a lot of it is the location as much as anything. It definitely has an influence on how people view the countryside, how they view uh, environmentalism, how they view their place in the world, uh, environmental impacts of whales have been, you know, as early as tin and stone in the Stone Age, and then the Bronze Age, going forward even to the Iron Age, and especially in the Roman period when the Welsh mines were developed by the Romans to try and get various items out of them. Uh, sheep, of course, have been sort of... Uh, Kind of the Welsh national animal, for lack of a better word. And it's remained a fairly pastoral area, predominantly with cows and sheep and that kind of thing. As well, you also have this this grand sense of scale because you have large mountain ranges. You have massive rivers. You have the Irish Sea to the west. You have connections to both the continent and to places west of Wales which have developed over the years the connection to Ireland both as an invader and as an invading force uh, the connections to England of course and the British population in the farther reaches of the island and all of this is, has made Wales into what it is and we're going to go into this in great depth in the next episode. But I, I, I just wanted to get to this idea. What is this? Because a lot of times when you talk to people about Wales who aren't necessarily familiar, they don't understand, A, what Wales is. You know, is, is it a region? Is it a state? Is it a province? How do you describe something that for its own population is considered a country, but by every political measure isn't a country? And how do you intend to teach people about something like that when they don't have a concept of what it is from the beginning and so you have to kind of start from scratch and for a lot of people that can be difficult sometimes it's easy it depends on of course you know kind of your background and understanding so the other thing is is why did we decide to do this well for me it comes down to the fact that i love this history there's a lot of 
great depth in it. I also want to understand it more. So reading more of the sources and coming to understand the day-to-day -day life of people from the Stone Age to now is something I've always wanted to get more into. And I feel like this is a way to, to share that information with more people and people who have an interest in that information, be they people who have an interest in whales like I do, might have ancestry in whales, might just be curious about some specific subject matter that we're going to discuss. Uh, the fact that they've heard of whales because of some reason or other, be it the fact that they're in like, for example, this year they're in the Euro 2016, or if they're, you know, and they're trying to understand who, what's this country, Wales, and that kind of thing. Because I can tell you for a fact that if in Canada, for example, if you said, have you heard of Scotland? Everybody goes, oh yeah, yeah. Have you heard of Ireland? Oh yeah, yeah. Have you heard of England? Yeah, yeah, we know England. Have you heard of Wales? People are going to go, maybe. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. They love the flag. Beyond that, <laughs> they don't know a lot. So you kind of have to start from scratch. And, and thankfully, I think that's starting to change as the years have gone along. And we see sort of a transition in understanding other countries that's going on through globalization. But I think at the same time, there's still that sense of, I don't know this place, and I don't understand this place. And I think for most people, as we go, hopefully you'll come to understand what this place is. You'll come to understand why I love it so much. And hopefully you get something from this. And, I, and most importantly for me is I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk. As I talk about stuff, I want you guys to talk back at me. I mean, you know, correct me if I've made a mistake. I appreciate that. Uh, talk to me about what you think on these particular matters. What's your opinion on a particular issue or a particular figure in history or some grandiose idea and that certainly will be a great part of this podcast i look forward to discussing things with you guys and hopefully going forward we'll continue to build that audience and build the attention that we can get and hopefully build something that's useful fun interesting uh get you thinking get you looking into other resources get you out of just a concept into something stronger and hopefully correct some things and, and hopefully give you some ideas on other things. One of the things I want to do as well with this podcast as we go is talk about sources because sources are sketchy in, in Welsh history. I've listened to enough podcasts to know it's very difficult to come up with some of the sources. So how are we going to supplement where we don't have a source? Because if you talk about Wales before, say, 50 AD when the Romans invade you don't really have a lot to go on you have a very sketchy information from a couple of Greek sources you have the source that we have from Julius Caesar about Britain and a whole when he hits there in the beginning in the towards the end of the uh, last uh, it, BCE and all of this kind of leaves a vacuum so from a historical record standpoint, you don't have a lot to go on. So what we're going to rely upon, at least in the early stages, and probably, I'll be honest with you, through most of this podcast, because I think you have to rely on this to some extent, because I think it fills out things. So what am, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the archaeology. Because for Welsh history that goes beyond just the modern or written era, you have to have archaeology to back you up. And even in the written area, you can't take everything for granted. I mean, our understanding of how the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, people interacted with the British people was always based on some writings of Gildas in the 500s. And that's kind of determined, okay, this is what we think. Plus the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and a few other things have kind of cribbed from that writing. But the reality of it is, we don't know that any of that is necessarily true because the archaeological record somewhat disagrees with it. So what we have to do is we have to sort of weed out sources material and kind of say, okay, here's the strong parts of this. Here's the not so strong parts. What can we take from it? What can't we take from it? And how does archaeology assist us in understanding the way the world works? Well, history is not as understandable for the day-to-day -day activity as just from the writings of some monks or from the writings of someone looking at the great president or the great king. They are Archaeology does a great job of giving us actually the day-to-day -day existence of people. 
And when you're talking about people who don't make it into the historical record, like, you know, ancestors of mine, it might have been fishermen um, who might have lived a very meager existence, who were poor, but yet had interesting things happen to them. And as a culture had interesting things happen. Well, this will give you that background. It, archaeology does a great job of that. And that's one thing I want to really bring in, especially in the early stages, but continue to use beyond that so that you can supplement your understanding from just the written history. Because honestly, that will help us understand so much more. So what else can we use when we're talking about history and trying to understand more than just what the historical record has given us? Well, one of the things that we often do we use is and we have levels of, of reliability is there are sources that we can use over and above just the historical record even within the historical record you're going to have shaky sources people who are looking at something from a distance don't necessarily understand it don't understand what they're seeing uh, julius caesar describes the druids is he telling the truth is he telling his own version of it? Is it just his way of seeing it? Is it just basically a Chinese whisper sort of situation? You know, what is the understanding that's actually being expressed here? Well, we may not ever get to the source and the bottom of the actual event or the actual people, but what we can do is we can come up with some hypotheses beyond just the archaeology, beyond just the historical record, but also including things like mythologies, uh, legends, uh, stories that were written down in in the past because what those do is they give us a window into the soul of the people you know what stories are they telling themselves about themselves what mythologies are they building what what gods do they rely on and why you know is there a particular worship service they do why do they do the things they do like for example in the roman period in britain uh barrows which are, are large earthen mounds that have been built up usually over a burial site or over a, a, an urn that's been had uh, had cremations put into it and then they're at the center of the site or at the top of the site and sometimes it's used over and over again. Well, in the ancient world, it means something, but it means something different when you get thousands of years away from its original design, construction, and build when you have the Romans coming along who don't necessarily understand what it is, and even the Roman Britons, the Romano Britons who are seeing these sites, what they end up doing is they start to bury coins near the barrows. Even though they don't understand what it's for, they know it's a spiritual place. Same thing here. We can take mythology and legends and kind of come up with ideas of why the people would write these things. Why are these things talked about? What can we take from that based on what we know? And is there a way that we can kind of integrate them? Now, I'm not saying go say, oh, that guy's King Arthur and look at this and blah, blah, blah. There is ways that we can talk about it that doesn't make grand leaps of, of historical logic, but yet talk about, you know, why did they do this? Why did they write these stories? Why did they use poetry so much? What What is the reason behind you know, their choice of music or their choice of, of, you know, religious beliefs. And why is it that they switch those beliefs later on? And how does that influence them? Uh, in early Christianity, there are two groups of Christianity in Britain. Um, as the Anglo-Saxons come in, you have a Celtic type of Christianity and you have a Roman Catholic type of Christianity. And those two will butt heads. Well, this is part of how we discern what is the Celtic belief system? Why is it so different that there's this great debate over who should be in charge of the British Christian faith? And how does that group perceive themselves? Well, we can also take that with some of the earlier times. I mean, we know some of the mythology that was happening before the Romans invaded, at least to a certain extent. And we can try to, try to figure these things out and break them down. And try and understand why these things are mentioned and how do they affect us. Uh, one of the great things in archaeology is that even though we have a Stone Age, a Bronze Age, and an Iron Age, throughout most of that we have a Pottery Age. And pottery is a huge key to any understanding when you're talking about archaeology because it tells us where things are built, how they're made, the quality of the product that's being made, and what it's used for can be sort of 
gleaned off of some of the deposits that are on the side of it because even if it's been buried in the earth for years a pot that was used over us over a fireplace that gets stuff burned into it is going to keep some residue that you can pick out and you can kind of identify so there's lots of things that we can do to kind of look at things from a, from a, more than just the higher level of, of what history tells us but also go into as i said before you know the nitty-gritty of history and i think it's it's a fascinating thing and i think i want to delve you know, into what a roundhouse was, why did it look like it was, what was the point of where the door was positioned, is there a significance beside it, you know, how was death perceived, why did they bury as people a certain way, why did they change those practices, and how do we understand them as we look at them today, and why did they use certain burial practices and different ones later on, and what changes that, and what outside and inside sources change those kind of things. So we're going to try and delve into all of this. It's a lot of detail, a lot of things to talk about. I'm really excited for this. I think you'll enjoy it. I hope anyway you enjoy it. I think it, I think we're bringing something a little unique, hopefully, but yet at the same time, be able to bridge all those gaps so that you get a cultural, historical, archaeological understanding of more than just the great people as they're described in history, but also the people who are doing the day-to-day -day living and actually have to put up with all these so-called great people telling them what to do. And I think when we get to that point, when we can actually talk about, you know, more than just the, the big men, and predominantly were men, of history, these figures that are, that historians back in previous eras used to think were the driving force of history, but most historians now discount that they will become a lot less important as we understand the greater cultural significance of things that were going on, the day-to-day -day living of what was going on. And we can break down and understand why things happened the way they did as they, as they move along through history. So hopefully we get a good context at both a macro level and a micro level, and we can develop an idea of what people were like on a day-to-day -day basis and Hopefully I can differentiate this enough that, so that you'll see value, you'll come back, and you'll continue to listen. I hope you will. Uh, this is our first episode. It's just the beginning. There's so much more to talk about. I'm so excited for this process and this project. We're going to push these episodes out as much as I can possibly do. I'll try and research as much as I can before we actually come out with these things. And uh, as I've said in the past uh, on the Facebook page, uh, now if you're trying to find us, on Facebook, you can find us at Facebook uh, forward slash Welsh History Podcast. You can email me at Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. If you want to contact me on Twitter, I am John DMP. We are on iTunes. We are on Stitcher. We are also on, and I'm really excited about this, Google Play, so that even Android listeners who don't have a necessarily have a, a podcast app can use Google Play to listen to us. And Hopefully in the future, we'll continue to expand our reach as we go along. And you can help us out to do that by liking us on Facebook, like us on, like, you know, follow me on Twitter and, and chat to me because I appreciate that. And I will respond to questions you might have. I mean, I know all the answers right up front. I might have to look them up. I might have to go talk to someone else, but I will try and answer any questions you have. And certainly I love just chatting about anything in the day-to-day -day, i do a number of other podcasts so you might want to check some of those out you can check out everything that we're doing across the podcast networks on distractionsmedia.com and uh, i hope to talk to you all next time come with us as we start going in circles as we begin the stone age in wales bye bye everybody and good night This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.